So for the past 10 months, ProPublica and Capital May have been partnering on an investigation into the loss of low-income housing at residential hotels in Los Angeles. And I'm very pleased to bring up to the stage, actually he's already here, yeah. Peter Hong, Capital May's editor-in-chief. Peter spent 15 years at the LA Times, where among other things, he reported on the city's enforcement of development regulations in and around the downtown area. Peter also spent a number of years as a high-level aide in county government. Fun fact about Peter, during the pandemic, when all of us were hunkering down, he took off for Istanbul, where he spent a year, and then moved on from there to Mexico City. I'm thrilled that Capital Name lured him out of early retirement to become our editor-in-chief. Peter, take it away. Thanks very much. Thank you. Before we uh, get into the particulars of the program, I, I just want to thank, thank Danny and the, everyone else who made this possible. Erin, um, uh, Aubrey Kaplan, our board chair, is here in the audience. And, um, but really, ProPublica made all of this possible, and uh, I think a lot of you know about the state of journalism today, uh, the difficulty in, in carrying out this kind of important work. So they partnered with us and supported us um, by providing all kinds of resources, uh, including um, the help from their very large staff. Uh, people like the editors of this series, uh, Michael Mishak and Michael Gravel. Uh, Gabriel Sandoval from Popovica was the reporter researcher who teamed up with Robin. Their uh, photography, social media, and the events team, Connor Goodwin could be here tonight, the communications manager of Popovica was instrumental in putting this together. Um, and Lucas Waldron is here tonight from ProPublica. Pro Thank you, Lucas, for coming. Um, Sarah Bluestein, the assistant managing editor, oversees the local reporting network of which we were a part through this project. And the managing editors uh, of ProPublica really gave us their full support. They're actually my former Los Angeles Times colleagues, Charles Ornstein and Tracy Weber. So you know, I thank all of them. So there was a lot of journalistic heft that went behind this that you all uh, are the beneficiaries of. And the event tonight, Marco Amador, our creative director of Capital Main, and Rubito Rosco here, uh, really did a great job in, in getting all of this together for us. So, you know, we're here because on her first day in office, Karen Bass, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, declared a housing emergency. <coughs> and um, the housing crisis, as, as all of you know, um, actually you know, it has been kind of institutionalized in LA this year long before that. Um, and uh, Around the turn of this century, some of the city's lowest cost housing uh, were what we call residential hotels. Um, the kind of derogatory jargon I mean, things like flop houses, maybe you know, very low cost, kind of low service places that um, people could rent for a very low amount of money. Um, but also, uh, as many of you who supply for apartment recently knows, you know, they could often get in without a lot of the barriers, you know, the applications and, and, and different things that people need to get housing. So it really was kind of an important component of the mix of housing for people in Los Angeles. So in, in 2008, recognizing this, the city passed an ordinance to preserve this type of housing. Um, but uh, you know what happened in the ensuing 15 years, which the ProPublic and Capital Investigation, uh, Capital Investigation found, uh, was that multiple residential hotels really were just operating as hotels that the residents who had been living there on a monthly you know, basis or longer um, were displaced and left. And some of them got converted to somewhat high-end properties. Um, others just uh, operated as, as 90 or short-term rentals. But, but the main thing is that this option for people to have um, a place to live at a, at a low rate in Los Angeles uh, with a low kind of barrier to entry um, was greatly reduced or if not eliminated. And, um, you know, after our investigation was published, which found that, you know, we found from our own uh, investigation that, that 21 of the more than 300 properties were operating this way. But that's sort of what we were able to do with our resources as, as a news organization. Uh, you know, the city now is investigating, but we really don't know the scale um, of the loss of this type of housing. So that's one thing we're going to talk about tonight, and, and we hope to find out. 
Um, actually, one of our panelists, uh, uh, who's not here yet, but it's on its way, is Tom Minkler, who lived in uh, a residential hotel, one right across the street, the yeah, American Hotel, uh, that exists today, as a really, where Al's bar is. Um, but Robin uh, is the, the, the lead writer on the story, reporter for her project. Robin is a reporter at Capitol Main, um, but she's also done a lot of radio work for National Public Radio, and she's written for the San Francisco Chronicle of Las Vegas Sun as well. Robin's been following the uh, decline of Los Angeles' affordable housing stock for several years now. In 2021, uh, she wrote a series called The Gatekeeper about the barriers to affordable housing and the loss of affordable housing, the end of the city to preserve the affordable housing stock. Um, and among the awards she won for that was an online journalist of the year award for that series. Um, thank you, Robin. Uh, Barbara Schultz um, is Director of Housing Justice at the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Um, so in that position, Barbara manages um, Legal Aid's work on housing, um, houselessness, and community empowerment. And um, as a litigator, uh, and uh, she worked on, on location and policy efforts to preserve housing in Skid Row, including the uh, 2006 settlement at the Wiggins versus Los Angeles Community Redevelopment Agency suit. That settlement assures the affordability and preservation of residential hotels in downtown Los Angeles. So Barbara was, was really in the thick of everything, you know, post ordinance and also pre. Um, and uh, we have an important perspective from someone on the front lines here. Ray Patel is actually a hotel owner. Um, and he's head of the Northeast Los Angeles Hotel Owners Association. Um, the association advocates for family-owned hotels like Ray's throughout Los Angeles. Um, he has a 24-unit hotel on Colorado Boulevard in Denny Rock. Um, and uh, as a man of many talents, he also has a bachelor's degree in business administration with an emphasis on computer information systems from Cal Poly Pomona. And he has a master's of um, in legal studies from the University of California and the School of Law. And Ray is gonna have a lot of important insights about his actual experience uh, as, as an owner since the passage of the ordinance. So thank you all for coming. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the format. We're gonna start with 25 minutes of questioning of the panel from me, that guided questioning. Uh, and then there will be 10 minutes of audience questions for all of you. So when we start that part, just go and line up at your microphone there, and we'll call you in sequence. And after that first round of audience participation, we'll go then into another round um, of panelist questions for 20 minutes. And after they wrap up that round, there will be a second um, longer chance for audience engagement. And audience engagement, that'll be 15 minutes uh, until we close the evening. So thank you all very much for coming. So uh, the first question is for Robin. Um, you've been writing about the loss of affordable housing for several years. And how did you become aware uh, that the residential hotels were not being used for their intended purpose? And, and what were your findings when you began to investigate and your conclusions? Well, it's first of all, can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. 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 So um, I started this with two things that I think probably are no secret to anybody here, and those are that affordable housing is being built at a super slow rate relative to what we need, even though it's speeded up a lot in supposedly in recent months. Um, and also that the affordable, the existing affordable housing supply has really dwindled. And so I started this looking at what mechanisms the city had to try to preserve the housing supply that we already have. And I learned about the residential a lot. Um, it's super stringent on paper. Um, Peter described it a little while ago, but um, it, I'll just sort of lay out some of, of what it's supposed to do. First of all, it's supposed to preserve tens of thousands of housing units um, that are 
really by nature of what the housing is, generally one room dwellings, um, available to the lowest income people in the city. So it's really essential. And um, if there are, there are some 300 buildings that are designated, and if a hotel owner wants to demolish one of those buildings, or if they want to convert those rooms to short-term use, what they have to do is replace each unit one for one, or pay a super high fee to the city's affordable housing trust fund. Um, and that fee consists of acquiring the land and then building each unit that they would have taken off the market. Um, so the law is super strict, but as Peter said, what we found is that um, it was sort of just being ignored. It wasn't being enforced at all. And um, once we, we discovered that a lot of the hotels were just blatantly advertising online, um, they were advertising with outdoor signs, their, their buildings were just clearly designed for short-term use. And city inspectors had been in and out of those buildings, um, but they really um, had not enforced the residential hotel law. Um, so our reporting looked at tons of city records, thousands of pages to try to confirm that and figure out exactly how it happened. And so our the theory that probably some of you have read is the result of that. Thanks, Robert. Um, Barbara, in, in kind of the, the, the bigger picture of low cost housing in Los Angeles, what's the significance of, of the, the part that residential hotels play in that mix? And what's been the consequence in the last 15 years of the lax enforcement of, of the law? So um, I think it's important to understand that residential hotels are impacted by state law, local law, and also um, a subset of those are impacted by the settlement agreement that uh, we referred to. So um, there's a definition of residential, residential hotel in the California Health and Safety Code. It's a pretty simple definition. It's six or more guest units that are rented out and the majority of people living there, it must be their primary residence. In other words, they're, they're tenants, right? So you have 100 units, 51 of them have to be tenants, and that's their primary residence, and then it's considered a residential hotel. So residential hotels in Los Angeles are a very unique uh, housing stock because, because they are so protected. And the reason for that is they are exempt from the Ellis Act. The Ellis Act is the law, the state law, that allows owners to go out of the business of being a landlord. However, the Ellis Act has an exemption for certain cities, including Los Angeles, if they want to protect residential hotels, which is what Los Angeles did. So they passed the residential hotel ordinance. Now, you know, what this means is, you know, unlike any apartment building where a landlord can decide at any given time that they don't want to be a landlord anymore, or they want to claim that they don't want to be a landlord anymore, and Ellis the building, that, that can't happen to residential hotels. So it's, it's, a, it's a very unique, very highly protective source of housing, which really needs to be protected. So of course there's the local ordinance that Robin talked about, um, and that protects residential hotels throughout the city of Los Angeles. Um, Robin mentioned a little bit about what it does. What it doesn't do is it doesn't protect the affordability level of the unit. Um, it, it, it exempts affordable housing and it allows for a mix of both uh, residential and tourist units, um, which, as you can imagine, causes some problems when it comes to enforcement. Um, so then there's the Wigan segment. Um, and um, so, uh, simple background I've been working on residential hotels for about 20 years, and I've been working. Uh, alongside um, the Los Angeles Community Action Network, who has been um, you know, working on this uh, for the last couple of decades, and it's one of their, their primary missions is, is to preserve this housing. So we got this lawsuit, we got a settlement called the Wigan Settlement. Now, and, and that was in 2006. So that goes 
above and beyond the residential hotel ordinance, but it only protects uh, the hotels basically in downtown LA. It's in two redevelopment areas, the city center and the central industrial rede redevelopment areas. And what that does is it ensures that the affordability level of the units are protected. Um, there's no affordable housing exemption, and there's no mixed tourist and uh, residential use. It also goes a little bit beyond the residential hotel ordinance, which is about conversion and demolition, because it also uh, is triggered when buildings are, are being um, re rehabilitated. Um, so those are kind of the different protections that residential hotels have in Los Angeles. Um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Sure. Is there a Tom who just joined us? Yeah. Great. Cool. Okay, so uh, this is Tom Ninkler, and Tom actually was a resident uh, in a residential hotel for 15 years, and he'll, he'll um, fill us in on his experience in just a minute. So Tom, let me catch you up, though. Robin and Barbara just kind of give the bigger overview uh, of the law, and then Barbara just explains really what a residential hotel is, how it fits in kind of the scheme of affordable housing, and then the, the various other laws, the Dallas Act, and how it fits into those things. But uh, maybe you can just, just tell us, uh, you know, we talked about residential hotels as, as meeting a particular need in a very high cost housing area. What was your experience? When did you move in? To a residential hotel, why was this the right option for you? And when you left, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the circumstances of your meeting. And then when you left, um, what have the options been for you now since then? And is it something, is it a type of housing that you'd like to get back into? Barbara, did you need to say something? Oh, I, I thought I started. Okay, Tom, why don't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever you want. Yeah, no more. Yeah, yeah, oh, First, I live in, uh, all over the city, different places, like four or five years at a time. I lived in Beach and Canyon, sharing a house with some people. That was the last thing, but some pipes broke, and we had people with landlords, and you know, all these things, so. But I wanted a place where I could live that wasn't just a regular apartment, you know, not anywhere in the city. I wanted something different, so I was looking at, you know, places, and I would rent some of those, buy some of those things, bring them to apartments, and um, I lived in a loft on Wall Street, and, there was an elevated parking thing, so if you want to leave the work in the morning, you have to get someone to maybe move the car off the elevator so you can get out. Um, and then I looked at the back of the LA Weekly, and I saw this place that was like a loft, you know, shared bathrooms. Uh, and then I looked at it, and it was kind of, I had two big rooms in the corner, and it was just like a perfect kind of place that I wanted to live. It was like above the street. You look over the street, was, you're on top of the store. There's people walking around outside. You hear people talking in the morning. and um, I had a short bathroom, but it was kind of what I wanted, and also I had to play guitar and practice and stuff, so I wanted a place where I could make some noise, you know what I mean? If you live in a regular apartment, it's really hard, and it's water. And this place was on the corner, so uh, I could put my guitar in there, and we would bother the people on the one side, and the one guy upstairs, this guy right here, so it just seemed like a really cool idea. There was a locked door in the front, so even though we had to yell up at the toast used to manage, we had to yell up, you know, to get down. It was safe that way. You could no one just walk out. Of the street, so. Um, so the first part of the question, right? Yeah, yeah. and I, I just like the yeah, trying to figure out to tighten it better. One. So. Maybe you tell us a little bit about the economics of it too. Yeah, I mean, at the time, the time it didn't really matter. At the time, it didn't really matter, but uh, economics. At the time, I don't know. I mean, I, I had a just job at the time, so it did, but I liked the fact that it was cheap. It's 450 bucks a month. We had to share the bathroom, so at the time it didn't matter so much, but it was a great benefit. But then as time went on, I became a temp and did different things, and sometimes I was out of work and beyond employment. So I really needed the affordable rent, you know. And considering a lot of places are $1,200 or more, you know what I mean? It's hard to remember back that far, but that was a big help. So the rent, you know, it started at 450 a month. This is in the year 2000, 1999, 2000. And it went up over time, you know, it was like six, something towards uh, six or seven towards the end. But um, at the end, though, I really, I was partying a lot. I, I worked occasionally, so I really needed an affordable place 
you know, and at that time. And I wanted to stay downtown because I loved it downtown. I didn't really like the suburbs and apartment things. Um, and I just loved it down there. All the people were there. Our chair was here. There was in the van. We got upstairs and so a lot of things. And I really didn't want to, I thought maybe that I would live there until I died. Honestly, I thought I liked it that much, even though the shared bathroom. But um, then, so I, I really couldn't afford that. I didn't want to live anywhere else. Um, how am I in the question? That's the next part. Yeah, well, it's kind of, you know, once, once you figure you left, and then once you left. Okay, so, yes, so they started to change things and kind of remodel it, and then at one point the laundry room was gone, because I guess they were remodeling, but then we didn't have a laundry, and we felt like we signed up for a laundry, and there's no laundry. Um, and it just became difficult, and I guess they were trying to, you know, seem like, now I have to think about all the stuff that happened this uh, was a long time ago. But people were moving out and they were getting some payouts or whatever. And then at the time, it came to the point where I wasn't going to be able to pay the rent because I wasn't working and I would get evicted. So I decided to take the payout to leave. Uh, I think at the time it was offering like 7000 but I, I guess for 10 and then they gave me ten thousand dollars to move, so it was worth it to me at that point. And were you able to find uh, housing, or even housing now that was as affordable? Uh, well, it turned out that I needed like a sober living place, so in that case, it was it was kind of the same price, like four hundred a month. So that one don't work. But I didn't I didn't want to live. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to go back to the suburbs. I mean, the suburbs are great. Pasadena is nice. Stockton is really nice, but I just don't. I like downtown. I, didn't, I wouldn't have wanted to, you know, I would have chose to go there. Uh -huh. So at the time it was okay, and then now I found a uh, group of guys from like my church or whatever that already had a place and they had a room that was empty. So, but now it's the rent's higher. But we're still, we're still doing okay, like between seven and eight hundred, depending on what you build. So your accommodation was to go into a group setting? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to run this or whatever. Okay. Um, Ray, can you tell us uh, about? Um, your experience as a leader of an organization representing hotel owners like yourself throughout the city. Um, uh, many of them opposed the ordinance um, and uh, had some concerns about its implementation. You told me earlier that you actually um, are, are supportive of uh, generally of the ordinance. I don't know if you supported it at the time. Um, but uh, maybe you could tell us about what your experience was and what maybe could have been done differently or should be doing, done differently going forward. Absolutely. So, uh, good evening. Um, I'm president of Northeast Los Angeles Hotel Owners Association. It was formed uh, back in 2005 to address adverse legislation to the hotel industry. Predominantly, the hotels that we advocate for are the limited service hotels, which um, uh, since the 70s, 80s, and 90s, a lot of immigrants came to America from our community, back home from India, and started working in these hotels minimum wage jobs and ended up purchasing them, the, the smaller motels throughout Los Angeles. And over time, um, the communities grew and the acquisitions grew where a lot of families came, started owning these motels. And uh, the city started passing legislation that would affect us negatively. So one of them was the uh, residential hotel ordinance. And uh, uh, just for the record, our association never opposed the ordinance, it was the methodology uh, that the staff at the Los Angeles Housing Department uh, used uh, to determine if we were a residential hotel. So what happened is um, back in, in 2008, during Mayor Villagosa's time, and the general manager then at that time was Mercedes Marquez, and the concerns were that in downtown LA, big developers would come in and tear down these residential hotels, and they wanted to preserve them. So the ordinance was, uh, redrafted uh, to address that, and LHD got a list of hotels based on their criteria from the Los Angeles Building Safety Department. And uh, we, uh, we saw that they were sending out these bills called the SCEP RSO invoices uh, prior to the ordinance being uh, voted into law or its revision, and they were asking for fees, about $100 a unit. And we couldn't get answers, and my hotel was also a 24-unit hotel in Eagle Rock. 
And whenever you called the number on the on the bill, nobody would answer. Just ring and ring and ring. And then you would get these collection notice type of uh, letters from the city attorney's office. So we reached out to the city attorney's office, and they basically said, "Look, we give these memos to them, and they like whatever they need to, and they send it out." So eventually, the invoices stopped coming, and then city council was approving this revision of the residential hotel ordinance. And so we approached the housing committee and said, hold on a second, uh, we're getting these letters, and these letters are asking us to send our 2005 guest registration cards. And keep in mind, this ordinance is, 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 was approved in 2009. And we have to turn these guest registration cards for a specific period of, of October 2005. And it would be turned over to the city staff to analyze to see if the hotel was renting at as a residential hotel. And one of the parameters they use with anybody who stayed over 30 days through the month of October period or so, and was a, would deemed a residential unit unless the proprietor had evidence that that guest back in 2005, three years prior to being asked for these records, can provide evidence that that guest was not staying there for primary residential purposes. Well, as you can see, Three years moving forward, we have to go back in time to produce these records. We don't know what they were staying there for. And, and look, the market dictates to the lodging industry how we rent. So these hotels built in downtown LA back in the early 1900s when the motor vehicle wasn't around and travelers were uh, you know, accustomed to staying in a lodging establishment and sharing a restroom and, and shower facilities stayed as tourists in these hotels. But then over time as the motor car uh, manufacturing spread and people start buying cars, they start traveling. So motels like mines were being built for parking and larger rooms and they had shower and bathroom facilities because the market demanded that, it dictated that. And we were getting notified by the Los Angeles House Department. We were put on this list just because our hotel was built maybe in the 40s and back then the building department they issued permits by saying hotel slash APT. So all these hotels that have this designation were part of this list that LAHD included. And we're sending out notice that you are a residential hotel. However, you can turn over your records and you got to prove to us that you're not a residential. We are the preponderance, preponderance uh, of the evidence. So we were stuck because many hotels had sold over time. We're in 2009 trying to provide records that go back in 2005 and we may not own those. So we have hotels that are on that list today that are deemed a resident hotel, the roadside hotels, that are on that list but couldn't provide those records. In my case, I had owned that property back then. I turned over my records and they deemed I wasn't a resident hotel. But I had the wherewithal to do that. Now, these hotels, many of the ones that, that we stood up for, are owned by immigrant families. Uh, predominantly came here as immigrants, their, their children are running these properties like I am, and I'm an immigrant, son of an immigrant, and a person of color. And then we started seeing a pattern. So we approached LHD and said, wait a minute, you're being unfair. Uh, we don't see you sending out a notification to the full service hotels to find out how they're renting. It could be a residential hotel too, because they're known to rent extended stay for a long period of time. To the VIPs that come to town. What about those? So they were targeting more of the mom and pop hotels. Okay, fine. So we went to the committee and said, look, uh, to all the council members, you need to step in and look at who is analyzing these guest registration cards and determining that we're a residential hotel. And so there was a fee component, close to $1,000 that the hotelers had to pay. In the first round, if you were deemed a residential hotel, you could appeal it, pay an additional fee, and then they would ask for more records. And if they felt you still were a residential hotel, then you pay an additional fee and then you get this arbitrator, which was also a Los Angeles Housing Department employee that threw on a black robe, bought himself a wooden handle, and then you would go into this hearing. And then he would say, no, you're a residential hotel, or no, you're not. And the most important thing in our industry, is that if you travel, you can get Hotels, whatever the market dictates how we rent, and sometimes we will rent extended stay markets, and sometimes we're in tourists. And you saw during the pandemic in the city of Los Angeles how how tourism stopped in Los Angeles. You know, travel went down. So there was this great social experiment called hotel room key, where the government paid for rooms 
for the unhoused to stay in these hotels. And these hotels fall into the room uh, for a reasonable rate, only because the market dictated it. And it came with wraparound services, which was great. And then a year and a half, two years later, the program ended, people started traveling, these hotels again started renting to tourism. So, so uh, yeah, uh, we've never gone on record against it. I, I really respect this ordinance. I, I saw what was happening in downtown LA, and so did the owners of these smaller hotels. But we were part of that, and oftentimes what happens in legislation, our, our council people pass laws for good intents, but then that pendulum swings. And that's a term they use, and it swung outside of downtown LA throughout the city. And most hotels didn't oppose it because they're like the American Inn. You know, they share bathrooms on the floor for 50 gas and, and, and showers. And they don't have parking. So the market dictates that they have to charge a certain rate and then they accommodate guests are in the interest in staying there. But hotels like mine that charge $100 a night when this program was started, they were in the street. I go, that's not affordable. What are you doing? What is your, what, what is the, pur the purpose of this order is to make sure you preserve affordable residential hotel units. You don't convert properties into residential units. You preserve, that was the purpose of it. But just as many of these hotels over the time, uh, you know, uh, were designated as apartment slash hotel, doesn't mean they were residential. That was just a destination back then. So we felt, you know, very much shy and, and, and taken advantage of. And we try to bring that to the council attention. And uh, at that time, when Councilman Tom Lavage was around, that was a different council, and General Manager Mercedes Marquez got a presidential appointment, the Amado Reservation to head the housing of all of America. The interim director was uh, Yolanda Chavez. So they called her to council, because uh, it was a concern of some of the council members. And Lamanda asked her, what, what does this mean? Are they going to be forced to over the rates, rent sucked away? And she said, no, we just want to make sure we preserve residential units, whether it be the entire hotel or certain amounts. But there's nothing in there that says how you're going to you know, rent or what the charge. We're not imposing that. And you can't, you know. So moving ahead now, Robin's uh, in-depth, uh, you know, investigators, uh, I welcome that because this needs to be settled that a lot of the hotels on the list are not residential hotels, probably a, a small percentage actually. And the ones that you saw that are renting on Expedia and looking down, I don't know which one specifically, but even back then 15 years ago, we made that argument uh, to the uh, city attorney's office uh, and, and to the Los Angeles Health Department that these hotels are renting rooms on Expedia and booking.com. They're not residential hotels. Uh, they have the facilities to accommodate the traveling tourists or corporate travelers. And there is something called extended stay market, where people stay a week or two or a month or, or longer because they're in town for something. And how can you ask a lodging establishment to go back in three years and provide those records and explain if somebody stayed over 30 days that they weren't here for a prior residential food? So we just don't feel it's fair. And, and we looked at the group of hotels they're grouping in. They're predominantly people who look like me. Great. Right. You know? Thanks very much, Ray. So, so now we're going to start with your insights here. We're going to start our first uh, audience participation segment and uh, would love to hear about any personal experiences from you um, with affordable housing, residential hotels, or otherwise, but also any questions you have for anyone on the panel, please uh, come on to the microphone. Anyone has questions, please come up here. Hello, thank you so much for doing this. My name is Albert Singer. Um, Mr. Patel, I had a question for you. You were explaining the difference between what's been designated as residential hotels and saying that a lot of the hotels that were in your group were not considered that. But if they're renting for more than 30 days and the person is primarily living there, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand how that wouldn't be considered a primary residence if that person's only residence is there. And I'm trying to understand what you were saying a little better. Can you, can you help me to understand that? So uh, one of the criteria that LAHD uh, was looking at when they were looking at our guest registration cards, specifically in 2005, is if somebody stayed over 30 days, we had to provide evidence that they weren't there for primary residential purposes. So other than the guest registration card, the address was different. That's all we had. We can't locate the guest, you know, and inquire, or we bothered to. Uh, send a letter that wasn't time because when they sent us the notice for this inquiry, 
they said, pay the fee if you dispute me in a residential hotel. We look at the timestamp on the letter. You only had a less than a week to respond. And then, and then, so we turned those records over, and we, many of those were turning over if they had an abundance of records because they panicked. Like because the ordinance itself says for 55 years, your family will never be able to sell this hotel because if you do, whoever you sell it to or you, you have to rebuild this product down the street, and if you can't rebuild it. You've got to pay the city 100% of the real estate land value and 80% of the construction cost. Now, we're small business people. And, and you know, uh, we come from, uh, uh, as immigrants, you come to America to achieve something called the American dream. And then you finally get your, you know, your entrepreneur, you have your land, you have your business, and you want to pass it on to your children. And the market may not be there for, for this type of roadside hotel or hotel or stuff. And so you may have to sell, but you, you preclude from selling because you can't rebuild this product. That's what's ha been happening a lot. The original residential hotel ordinance was passed in 2006. Um, I, you know, why it took them so long to start administering it is a question beyond me. Um, what I believe happened is they looked at hotels that weren't paying the hotel tax, the trans uh, transitory occupancy tax. And so I think an assumption was made that if you weren't paying TOT, which is the law, when you're operating as a hotel, um, then you were presumed to be a residential hotel. And that's when they asked uh, the owners of these hotels to try to prove that they weren't, because they weren't paying the TOT. Yeah, that wasn't the case. My, my, that was it. It's untrue in a lot of our, our uh, hotels that we had right here. It was untrue. It was a lot that might have been that. But the, the reality is, uh, from what uh, the building department explained to us, because they were the, the overseer of this, and they weren't doing a good job, so that's why LAHD wanted to pick it up. Okay. And, and so then they told us, hey, we were just given certain criteria. We provided the hotel with these kind of licenses. And my, my case was ABD slash hotel. So, uh, so that's where the whole situation But We were paying transient occupancy tax. Did you need to see some round of questions? I wanted to just clarify one thing you you were able to help a lot of people get off the list, right? That weren't legitimately. When when you and I spoke, I believe it was when you first inquired, I explained to you that the instructions were so convoluted because depending on who you spoke to at LHD, you wouldn't get a consistent guidance there. And so what we try to do to our advocacy and dealing councils try to get some format so these small businesses would be able to follow it and they wouldn't get hoodwinked where they missed something when they turned in something to the government. And, and so we try to get that format there. And then with, with that format, these small business owners were able to follow that. Some that we didn't get to in time were converted to residential units. And these are Celia Roadside Motels. Yeah. Well, I believe you said about 100 you were able to get off the list. So how many do you think? The original list was 311, I believe, yeah. the original. Yeah. And, and today, we just don't know. Uh, things have changed, notices have gone out, uh, corrections have So at this point, we don't really know. Um, we're just, you know, our whole issue is uh, when the government comes, there should be clear instructions and it should be fair. And we don't fail on that process was fair. And that is our biggest problem with this ordinance. It's not that it's preserving actual residential hotels, which the market dictate they have to be, because of their facilities and what they offer, which we call amenities in our industry. Okay, next question. Yeah, I was just hoping that Barbara could talk a little bit about the patterns and practices of the many owners in Wizard Hotels, particularly like the 28 day shuffle and the way that records were actually doctored to make it seem like folks weren't residents. And so I'm not making this accusation with you, Mr. Patel, because it sounds like you didn't have a resident hotel. You used the fair process and you were released from the ordinance. So I'm not understanding your, your thinking around how unfair it is. But it actually was much more unfair to tenants than it was to owners and still remains that way in the way that tenants in hotels are really uh, ignored, overlooked, and um, there's a practice in which their rights are taken away. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, and Robin talked about the fact that there's an enforcement problem, but to me, you have to step back 
even further and say there's a perception problem about residential hotels. And there's a perception problem uh, on the part of our policymakers, uh, I believe. And there is this thought, first of all, especially back in two, you know, the early 2000s, there was a perception that residential hotels had all transient guests. And so um, the 28-day uh, shuffle was practiced in most of the hotels, which was when owners would tell someone after approximately 20 day, 20, 28 days, they said, you got to leave for a day, and then come back in order to avoid creating a tendency. Or you have to move the rooms in order to avoid creating uh, a tendency. So uh, we advocated uh, with the city uh, and actually you know, got, got that practice uh, to some extent, at least, uh, in the downtown hotels. Um, you know, it, it wasn't um, used as much. Um, so that is you know, one way in which owners were trying to pretend that these tenants weren't were tenants, that, that they were transients. But there was like this perception around the city as well, and we really had to fight that. But I think that the other perception which persists is that this housing isn't good enough. It's not good enough to be permanent housing. Um, you know, you have to share a bathroom. You know, there might not be a kitchen. So therefore, it's not really worthy of being housing. You know, and, and, and what we say is, you know, we absolutely wish that there was enough housing here that every, you know, a housing where everyone could have their own bathroom, their own kitchen, it would be, you know, completely habitable, uh, but you know, we're not there. You know, so as I said before, we have this stock of housing that that is so special, especially protected, and yet the city doesn't embrace it in the way I think they should. They don't use the tools at their disposal. They don't, as as Ralph and Tom, they're you know they're not enforcing the residential child ordinance. They most certainly are not enforcing the Wiggins settlement. Um, and so this is such a wasted, wasted opportunity and they're wasted tools when we have such an unhoused crisis. Thanks, Barbara. Do you have any other audience questions for this round? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Samantha Ramos and I am um, from Boston. And I wanted to I'm short, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I serve with Disability Rights California. Um, you know, and as a disability rights um, activist and, and, and advocate being a disabled um, um, person, I'm, I'm really concerned on um, the Olympics coming to Los Angeles. And I am also really concerned by the notion that people come to America for the American dream, which equals um, money, right? Because I think we have um, ethical and, and, and humanitarian, right? Like there's, there's reasons outside of money that people come, and sometimes it's those protections, right? That some people are entitled to. Um, I um, have been clean off the drugs for, you know, over a decade now, but, I remember, um, you know, being in some of the hotels um, in the area that you uh, described. So I have my own personal observations on what I experienced and how I saw the law being manipulated in different ways. Um, so with my lived experience, and now serving at the capacity that I do, and with you know really harmful laws that are being passed by um, state Democrats like um, Newsom and Susan Eichmann, um, I'm really concerned that um, the mayors are um, turning a blind eye to the dangers of the Olympics coming to town. And because there's such an influx of attention to downtown LA, I'm concerned for the well-being of other disabled people. Um, I've been able to visit some of the hotels alongside leaders at LA Can, and I'm really troubled to see um, how um, accessibility is, is ignored. So with what we know with the Olympics coming, how do you perceive 
the Olympics um, impacting uh, some of what's happening, and do you think this will be prepared? That, that, that might be uh, something that our panel is too familiar with. Uh, yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is, you know, history hopefully will not repeat itself, but unfortunately it often does. And I think the people most at risk are the unhoused, uh, the unhoused people. Um, because as we know, you know, with the world stage, you know, everyone's going to be watching LA. And, um, you know, policymakers are not going to want the world to see a lot of unhoused people. So what's going to happen? Uh, in leading up to the Olympics? Are there going to be step ups and sweeps? Um, you know, I'd love to say that ideally we'll have so many new housing units that this won't be a problem. But uh, I think we're all realistic enough uh, to know that that is unlikely to happen. Okay, thanks, Barbara. And with that, maybe we can transition into the, the next uh, round of questioning. So, so Barbara, um, why was the, uh, the residential hotels ordinance important? to the overall kind of picture of preserving affordable housing? Um, well, I, you know, it, it was important because of the unlawful practices that were occurring at residential hotels. So, you know, there was the point of reshuffle, there was a, a kind of lawlessness, there were all sorts of um, illegal lockouts. Um, you know, if you don't think this person is a tenant, then you don't have to go through the eviction process you just lock them out, right? So, you know, to that extent, uh, you know, LA Can uh, and I also did a lot of um, going to, uh, you know, the, the, the meetings of uh, police officers to tell them uh, why it was illegal for the owners to be just locking them out, right? Um, this is a problem that still persists and goes beyond residential hotels, obviously. Illegal lockouts are a huge issue for tenants. In LA. Um, but you know, the residential hotel ordinance was the city's declaration that this was permanent housing, that these were tenants, um, and they were owed protections. Uh, but also, you know, it, it it did acknowledge that these this this one housing stock was exempt from the Ellis Act. Um, but uh, you know, as Robin said earlier. Having a law on paper uh, is one thing, and having it be effective is another. Can you just explain what the, what the significance is of what this point you say about the exemption from the Ellis Act? So, so my understanding is the Ellis Act, Ellis Act allows somebody who owns an apartment building to say, I'm not going to use it as an apartment building anymore. So uh, I can evict people and I can make it So, how does this fit with the residential hotels? Because of that, because it, it, it can be uh, permanent, you know, and affordable housing forever. So, and there are only three cities right now in the state of California that can use this exemption. Um, the exemption is limited to uh, jurisdictions that are over one million, or because they wanted to include San Francisco, are both a city and a county. So basically, this applies to San Francisco, LA, and San Diego. Um, so until, you know, I'm sure that uh, in the future, some of the populations will grow in, in other jurisdictions, and then locally they need to decide that they want to pass a similar ordinance. So I think that it was important because it, there was finally the acknowledgement that this was not transient housing, that this was permanent housing. And, you know, we often call it the housing of last resort, which, you know, I don't know if that's the greatest phrase because, you know, I think some people, um, you know, absolutely affirmatively want to live in this housing. But, you know, the, the fact is that particularly uh, a lot of the hotels, you know, in Skid Row were kind of seen as the last stop before the street. So, so you've identified you know, the, the, this problem that existed um, of, of the abuse that was going on in this type of housing. Ray, it doesn't seem like you dispute that that problem existed, and you were saying you know there were, there were good intentions behind the ordinance, but from what I got, you said it was kind of in its execution. 
uh, then, then, then there was a problem. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. It wasn't a fair process, and we informed council, we informed LHD, the upper mm -hmm. management, but you know, they just caught up in this thing where, okay, we've got to provide housing, even though uh, they were improperly converting uh, hotels to residential hotels. Like I said, the market dictates it. The, yeah. the 311 hotels on LS, many of them had no problem because that was their market. So, you know, what what really bothers me with all the tax dollars that are being accumulated, right? Uh, we need to have the city of Los Angeles build affordable housing. And I don't know where the problem is. LA County, HHH, tax revenue from the property tax. We're still talking about the need for affordable housing. The city of Los Angeles, uh, hundreds of million dollars out there. You got home key one, two, and three, hopefully there's a four. This is the best opportunity to start uh, acquiring properties or building them. That big social program called Room Key shows that you can't just throw money at something, house you at a house, and not continue that service. And to just merely use residential hotel as an opportunity to say, this is your, your housing. No, why are we building our standards? But, but let's go back, so um, yeah, there was a problem that was identified, um, an ordinance that, that um, wasn't really implemented effectively, you know, by our estimation. And it seems like what happened then, though, was that after the pushback from the owners, that the city just kind of stopped looking and then uh, pretended that, you know, it was a sort of see no evil here, like you can correct me if this is wrong, Barbara. So for both me and, and Barbara, where we are now, right, after some years of just kind of looking the other way, we wanted to try to go back to correcting the, or remedying the problems identified early on when we passed this ordinance and to do it in an effective way. What, what do the two of you think could be done now by the city? Barbara, you can start. You know, this, when they, uh, now I'm beginning to understand why they started allowing this mix of tourist and residential use. But that makes it almost impossible to enforce because, you know, any owner can say, well, yes, of course I have uh, units on booking.com because I have X number of tourist units and X number of residential units. But unless they are designating which units are which, so, you know, number 101 through 150 are residential and 151 to 170 are tourists, you know, and then start proving that, um, I think they're going to have a really hard time enforcing it. So, and it doesn't sound like you're, you may be in disagreement on that, right? right? You're saying that you know, your hotel, for instance, was used as a hotel, and maybe that the problem was this kind of creeping, you know, different types of uses in a property. And then Robin, uh, okay. I, I was just going to clarify that um, the city has a list of mixed use properties, it's very small. Um, so yes, they probably do have a really hard time keeping mm -hmm. track of what's residential and what's not, mm -hmm. but most of them are considered a hundred percent residential. Right. And that was the test. They uh, they uh, passed the ordinance, the revised ordinance two thousand nine, they told all these hotel owners, we want your two thousand five records, we wanna analyze it. We have analysts at LHG that know your real estate is we know the hotel market, you know. And so they took the reg cards and basically if you were, had somebody over 30 days, that was the trigger, proved to us that they weren't there for primary residential purposes. We had to go back in time. Where many properties were sold after that, so they didn't have the books, they got flipped as residential hotels. Uh, properties like mine, I still own them. I said, well, here's my books. And you know, they looked at it and go, okay, this is not a residential. But we got on the list because of the parameters that LAHD asked building and safety uh, gave them the parameters, and that's where that original list came from. So when you say mixed use and stuff, that's because if a property had 100 units or 20 units or 30, uh, the trigger was when you turn your books over to the government, they said, oh, this one was 30 days. Prove to us this individual that stayed three years ago at your hotel, did not stay in that room for time your residential permit. None of the fact that the red card didn't have the hotel address for the guests, that's all the most property owners were able to say. But, but then, we would end up going through an appeal process, you pay an additional fee, and then you pay an additional fee to get uh, in front of their judge, which was the guy with the wooden handle with the black robe that was still an LAHD employee. So that's how it came out. So we really feel chided on this. 
And, um, you know, I'm glad we have this panel because the simple fact that uh, there is a purpose for residential. But street, my personal base, not speak for the order, I don't think we need to uh, just shoot for residential hotels. We need to hold our elected officials uh, to the fire. They, they run for office and they always tell us we're going to get you affordable housing, we're going to take care of the house. When they get in, then it's always we recognize the problem. Why we got to accept them to manage the problem? We want solutions today, and they keep getting reelected, and then they get in office, and you know they'll send forty percent to legal aid, and this, and all these groups get all this money, but nobody's building affordable units in the city of Los Angeles. The city owns a lot of land. I don't see how difficult it is to build it when the money's there. Why do we have to accept the lowest form of standard and say you, the elected official, are managing the homeless problem or the affordable? No, build it. Uh, mayor, the mayor just purchased the Mayfair Hotel, right? $60 million grant, but it came with strings attached where the government said, we'll give you the $60 million, but this is transitional housing. Nobody deserves to stay in the hotel permanently. Better find a better accommodations. Or and everybody you. deserves an apartment. And everybody deserves to grow a family. These little 195 square foot rooms, how do you grow a family? How do you entertain your guests? You deserve better. Everybody deserves better. In my industry, especially in the limited service market, we are fed up being pointed to and burdened with the problem, and they're putting this housing issue on our shoulder when it should go back on the politicians when they campaign to be in office, get into that office. They come to us and say they're going to solve this. When they get in, now it's all about management. And this is what this residential hotel ordinance says here's how we're going to manage it for you. No, don't accept it. You want apartments, you want to grow your family, you want to entertain your guests, you want a place to park your vehicle. That's what you deserve. These hotels were built back in the 1900s or the mid, mid 50s. And the market dictated their residential hotel only because they have no marketability, so they lower the rates. And there's nothing wrong with shared bathrooms, you're right. And it, it's fun to live in, you know, right here in, in the arts district. But as a society, we've got to look, how do we grow? How do you expand? You can't just live in a box and wake up in the morning and go, you know, wait in line to use a toilet. That's unacceptable in Los Angeles. And we've raised enough money. We, they've taxed the business community now. And I don't know where that money's going. And when these guys get in, they're just like, we're managing it. I recognize the problem. Build these buildings. You have a lot of work that process. the developers, like the big developers, have on this council? Don't they kind of pay them not to uh, but I, build affordable housing? I, I, I don't want us to spread misinformation, right? There's a lot of affordable housing being built and going online now. It takes a long time to build affordable housing, partially because of all the, the regulatory scheme, which, you know, just what, in the last week or so, uh, the, the state just passed a law to try to expedite um, the permit process for affordable housing. Um, but there have been a lot of units built and going online. It's way too expensive, we can all agree on that. Um, but you know, that is, uh, that's, that's not uh, the fault of affordable housing developers. Um, you know, the, the one thing that Ray, I know we're coming to the end, but I would say the one thing that, that Ray and I certainly agree on is that uh, the city needs to do better, right? But as, as, you know, as Angelinos, we always have to say that the city can do better. And the city can always do better, you know. And and, and my concern, uh, my primary concern right now for residential hotels, you know, and, and actually affordable housing in general, is there is such a focus right now um, in in the mayor's office about uh, about getting rid of visible homelessness that the all all thought and all effort is towards income housing. And that one thing I absolutely do not want to see is permanent housing in residential hotels converted to interim housing because it's not good enough to be permanent housing. That is a step backwards, right? And that is a total 180 about the housing first model that LA was one of the first to adopt. So that is really my concern about residential hotels and about the direction we're headed right and Ray, it doesn't. It sounded like you may not be in disagreement, though, with removing this kind of ambiguity. Was just saying something is residential or it's a hotel. 
and not allowing this mixed use? Do you, do you think, is there a constituency of hotel owners that wants to continue this sort of mixture? I don't see a problem with the mixed use. This ordinance actually, uh, LA is interesting. Most laws that they pass like these, it comes from San Francisco. And then it trickles down to here. They have mixed use over there. And the reality is this litmus test that they have, they're trying to determine if back in time that room was rented over 30 days, you got to prove it wasn't for prime resident. The other room, when you turned over the records, they didn't have people stay over 30 days. They said, oh, that, that was never rented over 30 days in October of 2005, so that's okay. Uh, we're not going to scrutinize that room. So it's this whole so pattern, a, I'm talking, yeah, thank you. So this pattern that they have is our issue with the ordinance. Uh, LHD explained to us that you know, there, there's a percentage of rooms that they're going to find. If you hit that mark, then they'll probably determine if it's 100% residential. So there's that mixed part right there. But I don't think you can just go in and say, you got 10 rooms out of 100 that are redetermined this, so the whole hotel is going to be residential. Because, uh, look, it's not, I don't think anybody here agrees that the proprietor owns a property, especially these small businesses, which are on this list. And you say, okay, now you're a residential hotel, so here's the thing for 55 years. If you try to sell your business, you want to retire or whatever, or your children in here, they want to sell it for whatever because it's not working out. Well, then you've got to make sure you build the city an equivalent property in that vicinity or pay 80% of the construction costs. Then. Now, who in this room thinks that's fair? That's not fair. Okay, Barbara, what do you um, I just wanted to explain the 2005 date. So again, this ordinance was passed in 2006. When ordinances are passed, you know, council talks about them for six months, for a year, and what they don't want is for while those conversations are going on, for you know, for people to do whatever it is the ordinance is protecting. So in this case, they didn't want a bunch of owners to ellis their buildings and go out of business. So that's why it was backdated. And this happens with many ordinances, particularly ones that are protective ordinances. So why the city took so long to you know, send out notices uh, and, you know, and do the procedure, that I have no idea why. Not, you know, and I, can, I can understand how frustrating that is. Um, I think that city uh, bureaucracy frustrates most of us, um, and certainly tenants find it equally frustrating. So we can agree on that too. I, I, that's an excuse for the government, because no law should be passed, and then you retro back uh, to the citizenry and ask them to uh, defend it yourself. And that's exactly what they did. Okay. Yeah. What are, uh, you. In our next period for audience participation now, so any questions, come on up. Uh, I'll try to be brief. My name is uh, Daniel Lee. I was mayor in Culver City until last year. We uh, purchased two motels that are yet to be open through Project Home Key. Uh, we're dealing with similar issues, even though we're a small city, uh, and even though I live in the city of Los Angeles right now. Um, but it's really a little bit more complicated than politicians not doing what they are told to do. It's really about the most powerful lobby in the state of California, the real estate lobby. Uh, and that is the reason that we don't have more affordable housing. The reason the politicians aren't doing what they said they would do is that their campaigns are sponsored by the real estate lobby. I think we need to be honest about that or we're not really talking about reality. Um, I think the residential hotels are one of those instances where culture preceded policy. There was no affordable housing available, uh, so people who needed housing found it where they could. That is why it exists. So this discussion about the residential hotels is really about not dumping people out onto the street more than anything, and then also not exploiting people who have no other choice and nowhere else to go but the street. My question is, how do we really talk about residential hotels in a real way when we are talking about building more permanent supportive housing and we, we are talking about building more affordable housing? Oftentimes, even people who think they're liberal to be progressive think of residential hotels as places where there are only drug addicts and sex workers uh, because that is what we've been taught by American culture, at least I was. Um, and, and I feel like 
if we incorporated this type of housing more purposefully into our more comprehensive discussion of housing, then we would have a real conversation. Did you want to direct a question? Is your question to someone specific on the panel? Robin, did you want to say? Well, I mean, I can just say from experience that it's certainly true that um, a lot of people that I've talked to have lived in residential hotels, and you know, people still do because there really isn't any affordable housing. Um, and it, you know, they're just people that make a living on social security. They might be disabled. They might be low-income workers, and um, those places. You know, provide housing for people who otherwise wouldn't have it. Okay, next question. Um, yeah, so there's been a lot of talk about the housing department and city bureaucracy in general and its uh, failure, I guess, to enforce the law. And we see this in this particular case, we see it with tenant and harassment ordinance, we see it with systematic code enforcement. And my question, I think probably for Robin and Barbara, is what is your take on what's going on there? Like, the city council says we instruct the housing department or whatever city agency to do X, Y, and Z, and it doesn't happen. And what, why is it that you think that is? And what is it that the city can do to solve that problem? Because it seems like it it eliminates any power that the council has to, to do anything. Yeah. Um, well, I can start. I mean, as to why, I really can't tell you why. I mean. It's very common that the city council seems to pass laws and not do anything about them, like the ones that the tenant harassment ordinance that you mentioned. Um, one thing I should say, though, is that um, the day after our, our report was, our first story was um, published, the housing department said it was going to investigate these hotels. Um, the same day, the mayor told the housing department that it, um, needed to prepare a report on the hotels and also to report within 45 days on this breach of enforcement and um, to report on how they could prevent this from happening again. And those 45 days are up um, today or tomorrow. Um, so we're waiting for that. Additionally, they did start um, giving out citations, which they had done a little bit in the past, but. Um, what we hope to do is keep an eye on this and um, keep it before the public um, to see if they really do pursue what they say they're going to pursue. Yeah, and I, I would just go back to my perception comments. I just don't think it's a, a housing stock that the uh, city has really embraced um, as being uh, important, um, quite honestly. Uh, to the enforcement efforts, you know, I, I will say, although this is a relatively recent uh, problem, I would say, uh, just like so many sectors, uh, they are very understaffed. Um, you know, not to provide an excuse for them, but that is true, and that's hampering a lot of people from doing a lot of things. Next question. Okay. This shit's going over. You were wrong with this copy. No, this is but, hello, um, my name is Hakeem. Um, I'm really curious about some of the modern iterations of what might be perceived as a residential hotel. Um, when we talk about the definition that you reference of the residential hotel, that's a typology of, of, of a building. There are other typologies of buildings that kind of navigate this kind of gray area of exemption when it comes to habitable space that's rented to a person and the protections that come with and the guarantees that come with habitability. Um, you talk about some of those provisions where uh, a unit may be Ellis, but what are some of the implications of the conversion of some of these buildings um, that are doing things like room rentals, uh, that might exist in an old-fashioned pre-1950s building or something that might be in a modern building that was built in 2023. Um, good question. Um, you know, I think there there's also um, rooming houses is, a, is another 
type of housing stock. Um, and I think there are more and more um, of those types of housing. Um, and it can be very hard uh, to enforce your rights as a tenant um, when, when you're in that situation. Um, I don't really have any other answer to that. Great. Well, next question. My name is Ben Stryker. I'm the executive director here at Archer LA. Um, you know, we have affordable housing for the community here. We have 30 units upstairs, and so we know firsthand the challenges of maintaining affordable housing stock. And I think that, you know, the questions that you're asking, especially that you started with about, you know, what resources are available or what is the mayor's office doing and to maintain that affordable housing stock is one that's, you know, very close to us and that, and that we share your concern. I think that. I have a question and I also have a comment. Um, my question is about, you know, and I'm not very familiar with this practice, but how effective is this um, program of an enforcement aside in the sense that like some of what I'm hearing is, you know, they, they're not necessarily checking for people's income when they move into these hotels. So do we, you know, is this even really affordable housing in that sense? Is um, they don't doesn't seem to me there's any um, certification that goes on over time to ensure that there are actually people in need of affordable housing in those units. So is this even the best program in the first place to maintain affordable housing? So that's my question. I think my comment is that there's some concern among people here in the community because we are neighbors with the American Hotel about how some of this reporting framed um, the individual landlords, I think, you know, we've heard from Mr. Patel about some of the challenges that they're facing, about some of the questions around the program. And I think that, in particular, some of the reporting highlighted the artists who were, you know, it sounded as if, like, the creative communities eviscerated. Um, but, you know, we were here to witness that there are many artists who continue to live there. Some of them are here in the room. I know some folks who have been um, long-term staff of ours actually did live in the American Hotel until they Death, like one of our uh, staff, Terry Ellsworth, who died last year, lived there up until his death. And so we also have seen the good that the American Hotel has done for the creative community and to provide affordable housing for artists, which, you know, here at Art Share, trying to keep affordable artists in the arts district, um, affordable housing for artists um, here in the arts district is pretty critical, and we have seen them do some of that work. So I just want to share that comment. And um, I would love to learn more about how this program can. Thank you. Well, as far as the residential hotel law, it doesn't have any income requirements. Barbara can talk a little bit more about Wiggins because it does. Um, but the idea is just that for a one room place, the market might not bear more than an affordable rate. And so that's the idea of preserving residential hotel rooms. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's a, a really great question because, you know, we did see a lot of hotels, um, you know, suddenly seeking students. Um, I know there was a, a, a lot of bit of students um, in some of the, the uh, historically low-income hotels. Um, you know, not to say that students don't need affordable housing as well, um, but I think that, uh, you know, that the, the clientele dependence of residential hotels have, have really changed a lot. Um, and Robin's right, there's, there's no affordability attached to the residential hotel ordinance. Um, there is affordability attached to the Wiggins settlement when somebody, uh, you know, triggers Wiggins, then they're, uh, they have to replace the units at the same affordability level um, that existed in 2006. Not the same rental amount, but if a unit was affordable to someone at 40% area median income, then the new housing would have to be affordable to that that same um, group of people. I'd like to add that uh, you know, in explaining how the market dictates how a lodging establishment rents their rooms. So over time, the hotels that could not market tourists uh, were attracted uh, to uh, travelers that expected a certain rate, so especially the hotels that had shared facilities for bathrooms. And so the rates automatically, the market forces the proprietor to bring the rates down to attract that customer. And then they stay there. And over time, 
we're seeing now that the market is changing again. So that's where you're probably seeing students coming in and saying, hey, I'd like to stay here. So now they stay there. And then that's what the market dictates. It's the analogy I can give you is a dollar tree. You know, things were a dollar over there, you can go to Dollar Tree. Now, can you imagine if the government passed a law that said, okay, since you have products between one and five dollars, we don't want you to raise that anymore. Even the cost of milk will go up. You've got to keep it between one and five dollars because it it helps a certain percentage of the population that cannot afford to pay six dollars for a gallon of milk. So you keep your product within one and five dollars. So when you see the market change, hoteliers change with that because the cost goes up also. Insurance has gone up astronomically. Utilities have gone up astronomically. Labor has gone up. The upkeep of a building, the cost of labor and contractors go up. So how can we allow ourselves to accept an ordinance, which it doesn't say, by the way, just so you know that you've got to keep the rates a certain value. The rates can go up because you've got to pay your bills. The proprietor has expenses. There's no way you can expect a proprietor to keep a low rate because maybe 10 years ago they were renting their rooms at $400 a night, and now they need to rent it for $600 just to pay the expenses. So yeah. One thing we should say, clarify though, is that residential hotels are um, mostly covered by a rent control. So if you're a residential hotel, you can't raise from 400 to 600, you can raise the rent about 4% a year. Absolutely, that's why our association was advocating for fairness that a lot of these lodging establishments were not residential hotels, they were improperly being designated by LHD because we have costs, and if we were uh, put into that residential hotel program, that barrier would not allow us to pay our expenses. Great, thank you, yes. My name is Susan Sanford, and I have a question for Robin. But first, I want to thank you so much for doing this investigative reporting, because as we know, um, journalism is, is something that uh, looks like it's more and more in the past. And if we don't have investigative reporting, we don't have the facts and the truth. But I think that um, we were, we were supposed to hear what the mayor's response was to this report. And that's what I'm hoping, I know that you touched on it a bit there, you know, having to do with the 45 days, but is there any more that you can tell us about the mayor's response to the report? Not today, because there's not a report yet. I mean, <laughs> it was supposed to be released today or tomorrow. So we're kind of waiting on the edge of our seats for that. It's a big lie, of course. <laughs> <laughs> They claim it's going to be on time, but um, we'll see. This will be our last question. I think it's been, well, yeah. It's been established that each affordable housing situation is unique. Each hotel has different uh, aspects. So I'm, a, I'm here on my own, not, not solicited, to represent the American Hotel, which is right across the street. My name is Jesse Easter. I first came to the American Hotel as a low-income housing tenant in 1983. I still currently live there, existing solely on Social Security. At the time I moved into the American Hotel, it was basically a low rent flop house, many health hazards, bed bugs, drug issues, lack of sanitary conditions. It was not uncommon to find heroin and other drug paraphernalia in the showers. The previous owner let the hotel exist in disarray and disrepair. He not only showed no regard for proper living conditions, but was later fired by his own partners for embezzlement. At the point of Mark Verge, becoming the new owner. The American Hotel was about to be red tagged and most probably closed down and torn down. Mark Verge, believing in the concept of the Arts District, began the restoration of the hotel after spending an incredible amount of money, millions of dollars, and time. He completed the repairs of the roof, the electrical, the plumbing, the windows, the air conditioners, the bathrooms, which are beautiful, nicely tiled, and much improved all the living conditions, giving new life to the old hotel. He was able to provide 
a clean and safe living space for the existing tenants and the visitors from out of town, allowing a clean and safe experience in the neighborhood. Frankly, I don't want to go back to, I don't want the hotel going back to what it was 30 years ago. If the homeless were given vouchers to stay at the American, it would soon be left as a crime pit with drugs, drunkenness, and violence, affecting not only the hotel, but the neighborhood in general. Some would incorrectly use the argument, oh, anywhere but my backyard for the homeless crisis. This is not that. This is simply realizing that it is an improper solution, serving a law that would render an extremely negative outcome for the newly revised hotel and neighborhood. And by law, when people say, well, it's the law, I would also add, what about the underage girl that's raped by a murderer? She can't have an abortion? There needs to be interpretations on laws. It shouldn't just be blanket statements. ProPublica would have done well to do an expose piece on the real problem of millions of dollars which were awarded by City Hall to Mayors Vera Ragosa and Garcetti, who not only failed to assist a solution, but allowed the homeless crisis to grow by leaps and bounds. This is the crime. In my opinion, these millions of dollars awarded by the city could have gone into the building of homeless centers where housing, food, professional mental health, career counseling can be received. Not simply using hotels to eradicate the visual problem without addressing the core issues of why we have homeless crisis. I am proud to be an Angelino. I love downtown LA. I love the arts district. I want to see a real solution of bringing the homeless off the streets and into safe environments. Attacking the American hotel and its owners is not the way to do it. When Mark Verge held a meeting right here at our chair, introducing himself when he took over, and letting all the tenants know that they would not be asked to move out, and that the hotel would be restored. He also explained that if anyone did not want to experience the noise and dust of the next year's rebuilding process, they would be allowed to receive financial compensation, a payout, if they chose to leave, which he did do for those who left. In closing, Pro Publica, capital in Maine, ultimately, incorrectly, tried to paint owner Mark Verge of the American Hotel as a slumlord, a pit bull, abusing the disadvantaged and dispossessed, when in truth all they did was to kick a service animal, trying to serve the neighborhood by rescuing a dying hotel, providing clean and safe conditions with hotel jobs and reasonable rates for the travelers visiting the art community. ProPublica, Capital Maine, they got it all wrong. All right, well, thank you. And uh, you know, with that, we'll wrap up. I'll just say that uh, we did give Mr. Bird a chance to, to participate in the story. Yeah, no, we commented several times. Yeah, he yeah. Comment. We included his comments as a piece, and he was, you know, left, like everyone else in the public, able to come here tonight if he chose to. But I think, you know, we all saw that uh, solutions are complex. And you know what we hope to do at Capital Main and ProPublica is to continue to bring your room together in environments like that, this to have these discussions and through our, our coverage to inspire further dialogue. So um, thank you all again for coming. And um, you know, please continue to read us at capitalmain.com and you can also subscribe to our newsletter there to uh, get a, a heads up on, on future coverage. So thank you very much.